Welcome to the Chapter 5 lecture for the Management 3120 Operations Management course. I am Dr. Bill Perkins and I am going to provide you a video lecture based on the material found in the textbook Practical Operations Second Edition from Natalie Simpson and Philip Hancock. Our objectives for this chapter is to explore developing capacity strategies, bridging capacity, and weighting. And we'll touch on some models relevant to weighting. So the term capacity can refer to a single machine or to an entire supply chain network. It represents the maximum value that one can be provided in by an operation. And the uh, issue of capacity planning is not nearly as simple as it might first appear because capacity is rarely a single concept or issue for any given system. So for your purposes, capacity is the uh, productive capability of a system. So while the design capacity of a parking area clearly marked by parking spaces, um, many factors may lower its effective capacity. So pictured here is a predictable loss of capacity when snow recovers the painted lines and drivers must guess at the location of spaces. So this irregular uh, spacing of cars results in a loss of parking, lowering effective capacity. And the design capacity of a facility is a theoretical maximum potential. So to operate at this level assumes that nothing interferes with the design of the system, a distinctly optimistic assumption. So nonetheless, uh, systems are often presented according to their design uh, capacity. So design capacity is the theoretical maximum output of a system, assuming ideal operating conditions. There are operating ideal operating conditions. So the effective capacity of a system is expected to be less than its design uh, capacity in that it reflects the system's potential under normal operating conditions. Ideally, no one would want to leave broken glass in a parking space, but that does not that does happen occasionally uh, within a large parking deck, and thus the effective capacity of the parking facility is going to be somewhat less than its literal design. So in this example, broken glass left in a parking space is a factor contributing to effective capacity, and such factors can be investigated for any system. Uh, the gap between the design potential and the effective capacity of a facility often results from one of the following factors. You have routine maintenance, um, work breaks and meal times for employees, and bad weather. So when considering these factors, it is easier to comprehend than the effective capacity is the practical maximum output of a system, assuming normal operating conditions. Utilization is used to evaluate contrasting types of capacity. Utilization equals actual output divided by design capacity. And efficiency is another performance measure used to evaluate the contrasting types of capacity. So efficiency is a percent of a resource in productive use. Uh, efficiency equals actual output divided by effective capacity. So efficiency is the more operational of the two measures. It states how much of a resource is being used given its reasonable availability. Thus, by definition, we might expect that efficiency could range as high as 100% for a certain facility, though it is uh, its utilization would not likely reach that benchmark. Nonetheless, utilization better reflects the use of the total investment in the facility as the entire design capacity had to be funded and uh, constructed for use. Figure 5.1 here illustrates a common pattern of average cost changes over increasing volume of system output. So at low level of output volume, average cost is often quite high because of the fixed cost associated with the facility is um, spread across very few units of output. 
So uh, for output volume, any increased output level decreases average cost by spreading the fixed cost further. Um, an important phenomenon called or known as economies of scale. So economies of scale involves decreasing average unit costs by increasing volume. And this benefit of increasing volume can be expected uh, to end at some point. And any further increase in volume then increases average cost per uh, unit produced, entering the realm of diseconomies of scale. Diseconomies of scale involves increasing unit cost by increasing volume. At the turning point between the two ranges in figure 5.1, this is theor theoretically desirable optimal operating level, which might be well below the effective capacity of the system. So while economies of scale are generally driven by the spreading of fixed costs, what drives this economies of scale is more specific to the reality of a particular facility. Common causes of rising costs with rising volume include uh, traffic and congestion, which once uh, operating activity increases beyond a certain desirable level, the facility may have to work harder and spend more to simply stay organized and avoid confusion. You also have maintenance. Extremely high levels of activity can create the need for additional maintenance and repair while simultaneously robbing the schedule of time to conduct additional work if allowed to continue. And this can invite even more costly breakdowns as the system wears down. And then you have overtime and burnout. So extreme levels of activity often require employees to work overtime, increasing the cost of labor. So people fatigue as well. You have to worry about that. Um, and sustained levels of extended work hours can lead to mistakes, employee burnout, and potentially higher employee turnover rates, which becomes costly to an organization. And even though it is not possible theoretically, some facilities can operate beyond their design capacity. So the break-even analysis is a well-known business tool useful in a variety of contexts, one of which is capacity planning. So the commonly used expression to break even indicates just enough revenue to cover costs. So the break-even point is a level of activity at which the revenue collected matches the costs incurred by the activity. It's pretty cut and dry. If the fixed cost of the operation is designated FC, the variable cost per unit is VC, and the revenue collected per unit is R, um, the break-even point is the level of production at which total revenue and cost are balanced. An organization adopts, often adopts a particular strategy to guide its capacity decisions over time. Studying the history of that organization can bring these strategies to light. Recall that to adjust the design capacity of an operation or an organization must affect a bricks and mortar action such as the construction of a new facility or shut down an existing one. So what's, when such an adjustment is made, the overall design capacity of the system essentially jumps upward or downward at the moment of implementation, adding or removing what some refer to as capacity chunks. When these decisions are graphed over time, these chunks create a distinct step pattern, like the one here in figure 5.2. The uh, the timing of these steps relative to the demand on the operation suggests a capacity strategy of the organization. Now figure 5.2 illustrates the capacity decisions of an organization pursuing a very conservative expansion strategy and the design capacity is adjusted upward after demand on the system has increased the levels well beyond the current capacity. This wait and see strategy provides the following advantages. So you have high utilization rates throughout the organization's history that can translate into high values for return on assets and other financial measures. 
and you have shortages created by delaying expansion that might not necessarily translate into loss of customers. The uh, organization might be subcontracting the excess demand to another firm working on its behalf. And then although this strategy uses the design capacity to its fullest advantage, it suffers these disadvantages. So customer service is likely to suffer throughout the firm's timeline. You have competitors may maximize opportunities to enter the market and establish themselves by claiming unmet demand. And then you could have system overload, and that may result in higher average cost than necessary. Now, in certain cases, some firms deliberately create and maintain shortages, enhancing the prestige of the product. Any organization that is a monopoly or maintains a perpetual wait list for its good or services likely pursuing this strategy. An organization pursuing an aggressive capacity strategy expands in anticip anticipating of growing demand as pictured here in figure 5.3. Here the design capacity of the system is never allowed to fall below demand resulting in adequate uh, supply of its output throughout the organization's timeline. While not periods of shortage are present, figure 5.3 here reveals another strategic feature absent from figure 5.2, that's capacity cushions. Uh, because the organization is expanding in advance of demand, it maintains varying degrees of idle capacity, that's capacity above demand throughout its history. These largely idle portions of its overall system are also referred to as capacity cushions to highlight their ability to absorb the shock of any abrupt and unexpected spike in demand. Now, because this extreme capacity strategy is essentially the opposite of the conservative capacity strategy discussed earlier, the advantages of this strategy are a reflection of the disadvantages of its counterpart. So customer service is maximized throughout the firm's timeline, and competitors have less incentive and opportunity to enter this market. Now, the disadvantages of this strategy reflect the advantages of the conservative strategy in Figure 5.2. So you have aggressive expansion of capacity, lowers utilization rates throughout the organization's history, Possible, possibly translating into lower return on assets and other financial measures, and increased costs associated with maintaining the idle capacity cushion often provide little or no direct benefit in the absence of unexpected demand. Any system that appears at least partially idle at any given moment is likely aggressive in its approach to capacity planning. So remember, capacity cushion refers to the largely idle capacity maintained beyond the expected load level of a system to absorb unexpected demand. So commuter trains and other forms of public transport uh, often suffer rapid increases and decreases in demand during the day and on certain days of the week. So these operations much, uh, must expand to meet the peaks in this demand, often leaving part, large parts of their systems idle during non-peak periods. So here management shuts down the electrical power to its uh, capacity cushion and uh, additional escalator during non-peak hours. And a queue is... Uh, you know, essentially a waiting line, and waiting is a both a familiar and costly activity. So line forms and customers uh, wait when a system does not have ac adequate co uh, capacity to serve all the customers at precise times. Those customers place demands on a system. So queues come in many different forms, and they do not always involve people standing in line. Nonetheless, queues are, um, they all share a common anatomy of factors that create the wait for some service process and um, you know goods waiting lines uh, a, you know a good waiting line management begins with understanding these components as they apply to a particular situation 
Queuing theory often offers mathematical tools to analyze the weighting in that situation, given a particular type of queue. So queuing uh, theory is essentially the mathematical modeling of weighting lines. Now, other models of weighting uh, stress psychology, recognizing that most cues are, in fact, people being delayed. Uh, better understanding the psychology of weighting offers managers better insight into the true cost of weighting and might prove just as vital as mathematical calculations when minimizing costs in many service uh, situations. So modeling an existing or proposed weighting line uh, begins with an audit of the combined factors that create it. These factors define the line and are often used to match a weighting situation under study with an existing mathematical model, model that best mimics its internal working. Any cue forming in any situation can be modeled as the combining interaction of these three basic components, customer arrivals, the cue itself, and the service system, illustrated here in figure 5.5 here on this slide, um, the differing details concerning these three parts describe situations as varied as a queue of customers waiting to use a cash machine versus a queue of accident victims waiting for emergency surgery or a queue of cars waiting to pass a construction zone. So the first major component of any waiting line is the source of its customer arrivals. Uh, this component supplies a waiting line with its membership and thus influences the overall waiting situation. Now, to understand a particular waiting line's customer arrival, we look at key arrival characteristics. So one question to ask when studying a waiting line concerns the population size of potential arrivals. Is the population distinctly limited in size. Um, a a finite um, calling population implies that the overall number of uh, potential customers is small enough that customer arrival rate and the number of customers in the system are not independent events. Most lines are supplied by so-called infinite calling population. Although the number of potential customers is not likely to be truly infinite in any situation, an infinite calling population contains enough customers that the customer arrival rate and the number of customers in the system function independently. The arrival of one customer does not reduce the overall size of the population enough to change the probability that one that the another customer will um, their arrival will follow shortly. Uh, most on-demand services from arrivals at the restaurant to calls for ambulance service can be characterized as supplied by infinite calling populations. Now, how customer arrivals are distributed across time is another important characteristic shaping a waiting line. So one obvious example of this is whether arrivals are scheduled or unscheduled. So if a system can schedule arrivals into appointments, we expect, we expect less waiting than a system that must service random arrivals. However, many systems must service random or at least semi-random arrivals. And here is where uh, the study of distribution of those arrivals becomes critical. If an average of five customers appear every hour, does this average represent three to six an hour? Or does it average, or does the average include hours in which no customers arrive and other hours in which 10 or more arrive? Now to model the resulting line of customers, we must identify the probability distribution that best mimics the chances of these various conditions occurring. Now, traditionally, the uh, poison distribution uh, has been uh, a good fit um, when describing uh, random customer uh, arrival. In the uh, poison uh, distribution, the uh, probability of X amount of customers arriving in a certain time interval is determined. So the distribution is a discrete uh, probability um, 
distribution describing the likelihood of a particular number of independent events within a particular interval. So we can assume that these two queues uh, represented uh, two different populations of arrivals. The customers of the two banks offering cash withdrawal at this location. If uh, either case, it is safe to describe the arrival population and length of the line as technically unlimited and queue discipline is first come, first serve um, you know, for each population. Now, customers appear reasonably patient, although it is not known if some arriving customers are balking and looking for cash withdrawal elsewhere, which is essentially arriving, seeing a long line, and then leaving to go somewhere else. So, queue discipline is a policy of the system specifying the order in which waiting arrivals are served. So, queue discipline refers to the rules determining the order in which waiting individuals are served. Now, one of the most uh, familiar rules for queue discipline is FCFS, first come, first serve, as, uh, and that's the standard abbreviation for the agreement of first come, first serve. However, this is not the only rule that might be in use. Arrivals may be uh, prioritized by their expected processing time, such as shortest processing time first or longest pro processing time first. Um, arrivals may be prioritized according to some degrees of urgency, such as emergencies uh, first at a walk-in uh, clinic or one of those urgent cares. If the arrivals were promised service by a certain deadline, it can be prioritized based on the urgency of that deadline. This is known as earliest due date first. And then arrivals may be organized into special classes of priority, uh, such as seating reservations first at a restaurant. Some large entertainment complexes, such as theme parks, sell premium price tickets that entitle those customers uh, to higher priority when waiting to enter an attraction. So it is not uncommon for queue discipline to involve multiple rules. As examples, a restaurant may seat reservations first, and a dentist office may serve emergencies first, but the restaurant can be expected to return to the first come, first serve after reservations have been seated, while a dentist office will return to schedule appointments if there were no other emergencies. So if a system offers only one channel for service, then only one server can assist waiting customers and only one queue can form. Now this logical formation is formally known as uh, the single queue, single channel system. However, this structure offers options that must be uh, chosen carefully. For example, figure 5.8 here on this slide shows a diagram of a system in which a single queue is formed to await service in a multi-channel system. So this queue is uh, also referred to as a serpentine line, uh, familiar to customers at airports, amusement parks, post office, and many other settings. Now, serpentine lines are more efficient than other options in system structure. The formation of multiple queues to match multiple channels, as, as illustrated here in figure 5.9, uh, customers in a multiple queue system, such as the checkout lanes of a supermarket, can suffer great delay due to being in a queue behind a customer who requires an unusually long amount of service time, such as a shopper in dispute with a cashier. So in contrast, a serpentine system would provide the same extended service to that particular shopper, but the single queue behind that shopper would keep moving as other channels become available to assist other customers. And the serpentine queuing structure, however, does bring its own concerns. Management must work somewhat harder to maintain queue discipline. For example, the formation of a long serpentine queue must usually be uh, indicated by placing posts, gates, ropes, or ribbon around waiting areas to clarify to customers where to stand um, to maintain that first come, first serve FCFS without requiring 
the uh, customers to remain standing in a long line. And oftentimes, the more efficient serpentine line system structure is not in use uh, because one long queue uh, literally looks bad to the arriving customer. So then there's the concern for bulking. So uh, systems that utilize uh, serpentine lines are generally not concerned with the bulking behavior, wherein a uh, arriving customer decides against joining a line much like what you see at airports for amusement parks, uh, you know, tickets have already been purchased in most of those cases. And in contrary to bulking, remember the term um, reneging is when the customer joins the line but decides to leave before service is rendered just out of frustration. So a retail store, however, has a reason to be concerned with this quick impression of its service as the arriving customer may simply leave and shop elsewhere. So uh, nonetheless, the technical superiority of this single line supported by multiple service servers is attractive enough to motivate some retailers to innovate with hybrid systems, such as the one here uh, pictured in 5.10, uh, figure 5.10. Um, this illustration demonstrates uh, two uh, single queue dual channel systems working in parallel ideally the pair of server the servers working with each queue here will prevent a an individual customer from delaying others with unusual demands of the system while the two queues will appear reasonably short compared to the equivalent uh, single queue uh, for server system So mathematical uh, models uh, treat time as absolute, meaning that a particular delay such as five minutes is the same length of time regardless of the setting in which that five minute delay has occurred. Uh, thus, absolute time can be uh, thought of as time measured by a clock, and it is only logical to then conclude that an average wait time of five minutes is better than an average wait time of some longer amount of time such as 15 minutes. And psychological models, however, uh, focus on perceived time or time as measured in the mind of the customer who is waiting. So one customer may be delayed uh, five minutes and yet uh, perceive the delay significantly more than five minutes, while another customer may be delayed 15 minutes but, perce but perceive that delay, uh, that longer delay, is almost no time at all. Right. So one of the uh, central principles of psychological models of waiting is that the longer 15 minute delay in the previous example is better than the five minute delay, even though it represents three times the amount of absolute time. So, however, improving future wait times depends on determining precisely, or precisely um, why a customer uh, waiting five minutes perceived more time has passed. And while a customer, a customer who waited longer perceived almost no delay. So these factors influencing the perception of time are then the keys to reducing the future customer's wait without um, necessarily reducing the absolute time the customer's delayed. Um, so a variety of environmental factors influence a customer's perception of time. Although not all these factors are relevant in every situation, some factors such as distraction, fairness, and interrupted weights are more likely to be within the control of a concern manager and thus can be used to manipulate perceived wait time. Other factors like fear and the value of service may be system characteristics over which a manager has little or no control, but nonetheless are active in determining the customer's perceived weight. All right, one powerful and familiar factor that influences a person's perception of time is distraction. Most any delay uh, is perceived as a lesser amount of time if the person waiting is occupied in some sense. Thus, waiting areas for many services are supplied with magazines and video screens to distract customers from the passage of time. Now, waiting areas for extremely long queues at popular tourist attractions are often elaborately equipped for this, offering an inf informative uh, presentation and or um, entertainment specifically for members of the queue. 
However, this concept is not confined to long lines. Now think about the music when you're put on a lengthy hold during a customer service call. And also think of the type of music that they play. They're not going to play any type of music that's uh, going to just feed into your frustration, in other words. Uh, so the principle that fear makes any wait time longer um, may seem obvious, but the various uh, sources of fear among customers can be surprising. Uh, people obviously fear pain and harm uh, befalling either themselves or their live loved ones, and thus callers to emergency numbers often overestimating the passage of time that follows due to the nature of anxiety associated with the emergency of the incidents. So here are some less obvious but common sources of fear. You have customers fear loss of personal control, customers fear being forgotten about, and customers fear that there will not be enough product and they will not be served despite the waiting. And fairness is an issue of injustice in the mind of the customer. Any wait perceived as fair is usually perceived as shorter than the same absolute time waiting when the delay was unfair. So reasonable delays can abruptly be uh, become unacceptable if the customer is given a reason to think injustice has occurred. So uh, to maintain fairness, the manager implementing the first come first serve approach must enforce first come first serve on behalf of the customers honoring the rule and carefully design an unavoidable complicated queuing system to help prevent emotional reactions to the loss of first come first serve when queues grow long it is hard to determine which customer has been waiting longer especially when they have merging lines um, and if the need for service weighs more than the first come first serve approach it is important to communicate that to a waiting customer such as maybe saying I'm sorry but that patient was an emergency case I had to take him or her first you know that can kind of go a long way especially um, psych uh, psychologically um, the unavoidable principle of waiting uh, concerns the value of service the more valuable a customer perceives the service the more willing that customer is to wait and this is illustrated by this particularly long lines that can form to purchase tickets to a one-time event such as a concert or a movie premiere. Sometimes customers, uh, you know, with customers, they wait a day or more for the tickets uh, at the vendor's location. So in contrast, if a customer uh, you know, does not perceive a service valuable, then the customer is much less willing to wait and generally overestimates the actual length of the delay. And then um, you, you know, one fascinating feature of the psychology of waiting is that people often perceive the sum of several short waits as shorter than one continuous delay of the same length. So thus, uh, systems that cannot avoid long wait lines can work instead to break up those delays and shorten the perceived um, time spent waiting. Uh, long queues for amusement park attractions particularly achieve this by guiding a single serpentine queue through more than one waiting area. In this arrangement, when the customer moves to the front of a room and through a doorway, the customer generally perceives the wait in the first room as being completed and the wait in the new area beyond the doorway as just beginning. So they kind of break up those elements psychologically. So in summary, selecting the best capacity for a new facility begins with how to measure it, how to best measure it and ultimately requires an organization to weigh the cost of too much versus too little ability to meet its customer needs. Uh, waiting lines uh, format the interaction between the customer's uh, demands and the capacity chosen by the organization. Queuing theory offers mathematical models of waiting, allowing issues such as average time, uh, spent and evaluated. So queuing theory also treats time as absolute or reliably measured by a clock, a rational assumption that sometimes uh, fails if the queue uh, being modeled consists of people. Um, psychological models of waiting concentrate on time as perceived by people waiting and suggest factors in the environment that can influence that perception. Uh, mathematical and psychological models 
are not mutually ex uh, exclusive approaches to waiting line analysis and any organization concerned with customer wait times is wise to consider both and that concludes um, the chapter 5 lecture please uh, tune into uh, blackboard to look for this week's uh, expectations and deliverables and i will see you in chapter 6